What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the HQ. It's championship week. Me and Noah usually focus on dynasty or trade targets or whatever, but we've done that already too much during the season. So we wanted to ask y'all what you wanted to see for the last video of the year. So I went to Twitter. Went to nowhere else but the best place on the universe, Twitter, to get y'all's feedback. Make sure you are following both of us on the Twitter. If you want to be involved in things like this, and I basically just said, quote, unquote, what you know and I do for Wednesday's video. I even used good grammar. I didn't say me and Noah. I said Noah and I. I'm proud of myself for that. It did go all lowercase, but that's just on brand at this point. So basically, we're going to run through all of your comments or replies about what you wanted us to do for today's video. So it's almost going to be a free for all, a Q and a uh, kind of a shit show. And a lot of you guys wanted to see, I will preface by saying a lot of y'all wanted to, us to talk about like our biggest busts, the, the, the things that we were most wrong about. And every, uh, every off season I put out a video where it's like top 10 things I've learned from the previous fantasy season. And I shit on myself during that video. So don't worry that that is coming. The things I have learned, the things I got wrong, why we're still selling Derrick Henry and things along that line. So we'll probably skip out on all the in-depth stuff, but we're kind of just going to fuck around with a, a Q and a today. So thank you all for joining us as always. Uh, let us know what kind of stuff you're trying to see throughout the off season, because it is basically here. I mean, next week's video would be for week 17, but like, I'm not really trying to put out any week 17 content for the four people in our audience that have, uh, that have championship games. I will also like to say, over the last like two weeks, we've gotten a lot of apparel orders in the store for like fade the public hoodies from from women. We've gotten like eight or 10 orders from women. I didn't even know we had that many females in our audience. So thank you for all the female supporters. Drop a comment down below because I, I legit thought maybe we had like two, maybe three. Um, moms and sisters included in that. So the fact that we're getting apparel orders from the women, it's fucking huge for the brand. Really excited, really excited about all the support that you guys gave us uh, throughout the year. I know Noah is appreciative as well, even though he's just sitting over there smirking throughout the entire video <laughs> most of the time. Um, look at the, we got the curls going on in the background because he always wears a fucking hat. He's growing out the lettuce. Should Noah cut his hair or should he keep it grown throughout the off season? Yeah, I'll put out a tweet. I'll put a poll, and it's all going to be like, let it grow out so you guys can keep calling me a girl. But I'm right. fine with that. I'll just let it grow. Go to, the, go to the side real quick so I could do a screenshot. Is that side enough? Oh, we'll go it. back, go back. All right, now go like a 45 degree angle to the side. I should probably just turn the chair like this. Well, now go a little bit more towards me. Yeah, so you can kind of, no, 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 you were there, right? Nope. 45 degree. You know what 45 degrees is? Bro, I failed math. Come on. Yeah, fuck you. Okay. That's all fine. Right. It's not as curled up in the back as I thought. I used to wear a hat all the time, and when my hair got long, it would start to curl up in the back. And uh, I was still a virgin then, so <laughs> we, we had to cut that hair real quick. All right, let's start with some of the Q and A's. Let's hit the intro first. I knew you were gonna do it. God fucking damn it! <laughs> I felt it in my brain, like I was about to say, "Wait, never mind." Hit the intro, and I was just like, "You know what? Let him get his fucking last night off." <laughs> All right, first comment, question, concern comes in from a man, Dave Toffee, who helps us out with the brand, chopping up videos and whatnot. Your best and worst moves made in any league during the season, why you made them, and what you learned from a mistake that you made. Um, I mean, I, I would say I, hadn't, I didn't make a lot of trades throughout the season. In Dynasty, I made a lot of moves, but those are tough to tell, you know, like, so we can't really see if they come to fruition for a year or so. The first trade that comes to my mind, I think I made one move in the E-Town Get Down League. I moved Tyler Boyd and Miles Sanders for Zach Ertz, like midseason, because I had Hunter Henry. Uh, I guess this is probably a dumb move. I had Hunter Henry, and uh, he got hurt, like, immediately, right? And we didn't hear the announcement until, like, after waivers processed on Wednesday, and it was the, it was the week that, like, Darren Waller was available. So I didn't know Henry was hurt. So I missed Waller. And I had Henry and he had that like semi-serious injury in the beginning of the year. And I was like, oh, fuck, like he's going to be out for a long time. 
And typically I have like, I've moved to a no toleration process when it comes to injuries. If they're on my team and I know they're going to be out for like multiple weeks, I basically drop them. I almost don't care about the, I mean, they have to be like elite for me to keep them on the team, but I dropped Hunter, Hunter Henry like that. And then he was back by like week seven and fucking dominating. So that was a mistake. Maybe I need to uh, calm down with, you know, like fucking dropping guys that, that are injured. But for the most part, um, it worked out fine. So I ended up moving those two players for Zach Ertz, which has obviously worked out great for me right now. I will say it kind of hurts not having Miles Sanders, though. Like, that would be a, a dynamite flex play. And those one, that's one of those guys that, like, you know, we had waited for him to break out the entire season. We had hoped it happened by, like, week six or week seven. But I think it goes back to – I would say, like, I'm not going to say the biggest lesson I learned because this was something that I kind of learned going into last season, too, is just that, like, coaching – when it comes to fantasy football and how players are going to be used, the coach of that team is is almost more important than the talent of the player and, like, the personnel. Like, the coach decides everything. Is there going to be a committee? Is this guy going to play? Is he going to be on the goal line? If he's a rookie, am I going to play him or am I going to fucking be too proud and play veteran players? Like, coaching is so fucking important when it comes to fantasy football. That's yeah. one of the was- he was a second round pick, the most athletic back they have on their roster. And it took Jordan Howard, Alshon Jeffrey, Nelson Aguilar, like everybody getting injured for him to finally break out. And I know he and Robbie Anderson were both guys that we kept wanting to like buy and buy in on. And they didn't break out until we told you guys to stop buying in on them. So yeah. maybe a lesson is just to be a li- like a week behind us uh, or ahead of us and just wait after that. But yeah, coaching definitely matters and on the same side of the coin with Robbie Anderson. Adam Gase, just wherever he goes, he ruins people, and we're finally seeing Robbie Anderson break out, and he's a great player. I can't wait for him to leave. He's a free agent next year, so um, I'll be buying on him next year. So if I say to stop buying him week four, pick him up week five, he'll break out. Yeah, I, just on that Adam Gase point too, just like every time – I mean, look at all the, the players breaking out for Miami. Like Ryan Tannehill is breaking out now. Devontae Parker is breaking out now. Kenyon Drake is breaking out. Some still in Miami, some – all over like literally all it took was different teams Tennessee Arizona Miami just get Adam Gase out of the equation and we're good and we said it all off season. like we were, we were like bro did you, did anyone not watch Adam Gase over the last three years in Miami and how bad he was and now he moves over to the Jets and I mean he didn't ruin everybody but he basically ruined everybody in that fantasy offense so again just going back to just coaching coaching fucking matters so 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 much so that is one piece of analysis that you are going to have to really 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 hone in on but at the same time like Hindsight is twenty twenty. There was a lot of analysis that went into the year. Like, for instance, Kenny Galladay was a guy that we all liked from a talent standpoint, but in that, like, borderline fourth, fifth round pick, I would have rather had – I guess, I, I mean, I, I guess the guys in that area, I wanted Lockett over Galladay, which for the most part worked out up until, you know, the last month of the season or so. But we were like, oh, Matt Patricia's offense. And granted, before Matt Stafford got hurt, Matt Patricia's offense was fucking rolling. They were throwing the ball deep all the time. Like, the, their, their pass catchers were getting involved. So it's really a case-by-case basis. And, again, it's very hard to predict a lot of these things. So just just know that we're going to get a lot of shit wrong. We'll get a lot of shit right throughout the year. That's how yeah. I think another thing that I learned this season is don't overrate how good teams look in the preseason, whether it be Daniel Jones looking awesome or even the Jets offense. I was completely bought in on Le'Veon Bell because if you remember back to the preseason, Ty Montgomery was cooking. That whole offense was doing very well. You got to realize a lot of these teams aren't showing their full hand um, defensively or offensively. The teams that are showing it offensively, that just helps other teams game plan around them those extra two weeks till the season starts. So um, I think if you look at the coaching um, and you just know the identity of a team, like the Jets, sure, they had a lot of pieces coming in this year, whether it be Jamison Crowder, uh, Robbie Anderson, hopefully taking that step, Le'Veon Bell. Their offensive line still sucked and they were still the Jets. So I shouldn't have been like personally so bought in to a team that I knew in the back of my mind wasn't going to be as good as I thought they were going to be just based off of preseason and a lot of hype surrounding them. Yeah, I think if they had any other coach, like, we would be full in on a big Sam Darnold breakout right now. It's really unfortunate. So I hope they get rid of him in the offseason. That's an offense I would like to buy back in on if they get a couple good pieces going forward. All right, we have another one from uh, first name Daniel Go. Okay, this one. We're not going to do this now, but this is a great setup for a future video. Go through each other's Twitters and pull any comments or posts and make fun of each other and, like, have to explain them via – very, very, very bad tweets, which that video would last fucking hours and hours. That'll be very easy during the off season because that's all we post in the off season is like garbage memes and stuff like that. Uh, Scott, break down your own 2019 teams, dynasty and redraft, what went right and what you do different update on titles you're contending for next week. Uh, I mean, 
a lot of the principles that I went into the year with uh, ended up working out well for me. So I, I, like I talked about this, I, I streamed a waiver wire video today. So I talked about some of my leagues, but I made, um, I'm in the championship for four out of the five teams. So realistically, my process went very, very well. And I think when you're in a lot of leagues, if you stick to the process, I guess I don't own a, a single share of Derrick Henry. I don't own a single share of guys like Josh Jacobs uh, or those guys. So it's like, yes, that hurt. But when you do the other things right, when you stick to like stay away from the injured guys, stay away from guys that don't catch passes, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there are going to be unicorns like that. Stay away from guys that are coming into the year, like off these ACL tears. There will be like the Cooper Cups, but there also will be like six guys that don't hit on that. So when the process is usually sound over the long run, it tends to work itself out. So yeah, you guys, the thousands and thousands of people that watch these videos and one guy called out like, oh, you should have done this. Like, yeah, I'm going to be wrong on a couple of things. But over the long run, when you have a good process in place, when you're looking at the right things when it comes to drafting and how to maneuver throughout the year and shit, those things will work themselves out in the long run. So I didn't draft some players that, yes, are very, very good right now but I drafted plenty of players that are very good. And because of that, that will help me, you know, propel to having success. So hopefully we bring home at least two of the four championships, but um, how are you doing in your leagues? Yeah. You're going to be the only one pulling your weight on this one because I lost two leagues last week. Dynasty. I was up by like 40 and every game was in the fourth quarter. The guy had Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Todd Gurley, and somebody else. I lost 170 to 150 in my dynasty league. That one I actually traded for uh, Derek Henry. And so you guys can get off my back about that. Another one, I sat Jameis Winston because at 1245, I saw a picture of him wearing like a falconry glove. And I'm like, this is not good. I started Ryan Fitzpatrick. It was like, it wasn't bad. I lost by, I think, three points. So yeah. that, that kind of hurt. Shit. Yeah, I mean, I would do this. I, I sat Jameis Winston in uh, the one league I had him in, too. Luckily, I had Brian Tannehill behind him, so he played fine. But, like, I don't, that's another thing. I don't know. Like it, it, that's, it's so fucking hard to pick just sit starts based on the information that we're given. And Jameis has been yes, prolific, but like without his top guy, Mike Evans with the, yeah, that's injury. really my takeaway is like when you're making start sits, like what I learned this year and I kind of like, not that I always knew it, but it kind of just, um, uh, it was highlighted this year is like, always think logically about this. Like, I don't feel bad that I sat Winston because he lost his number one target. Uh, They're playing Detroit, who's just terrible against, like, everything to run the pass. So I figured maybe lean on the run a bit. Um, Ryan Fitzpatrick went up against, was it the Giants this past week? They just lost their number one cornerback, Janoris Jenkins. Like, I figured the the disparity between them at their ceilings wouldn't be as big. Um, Like, if James Winston had gotten hurt or just, like, even tweaked his hand, he would have went down halfway through the game. Like, I made that process. I made the decision. I'm not too mad that I made the decision. The other one I made was Cooper Cup over Tyler Lockett. It was a harder matchup. But you look at the over-under, you look at the spread for the game, and you look at the fact that the Carolina Panthers can't stop the run. I figure, you know, they're probably going to get up big. The Panthers have been terrible offensively and defensively. They're not going to pass the ball a lot. I was wrong about that too. So uh, a lot of things went wrong this past week, but I think if you can rationalize it, you won't feel as bad afterwards about it. Yeah, I I look at things like from a regret level too. It's like, for instance, you know, you wanted to start Fitz, had you started Winston and then it didn't work out, you would have been like, fuck, like this is what I wanted to do the whole time. So I look a lot, you know, this is just like life in general, but also fantasy wise, I think about like after the game, you know, if, if my logic stays put and this happens, like which will I regret the least? Cause you can't like kick yourself for starting Fitz over Winston. You can because of the, the fantasy points, but the logic was sound the process seemed right at the time. And had it happened, like you would have, you know, you felt like an asshole had you started Winston and then he ended up like busting, but you live and you learn. All right. Um, Nikki Snacks, the outlook for the Giants offense moving forward, probably like number 27 in the league for the next three or four he years. He was top five. I said, if you count from the back, they'd be one of the first five teams named. <laughs> Love that. All right. So we have uh recap, some of your hits and misses on players, why we're stupid, follow the guys you're wrong about. So a lot of these guys, obviously, how to keep yourself preoccupied when the fantasy season is over uh well here's the thing you uh you also are a human being so you, so you can live your life uh there are a lot of other sports you can get into the fantasy the fantasy industry is giant not just from a fantasy football perspective but you can watch basketball i mean you're nc state pack so you're obviously a college fan you can go follow it's college basketball do march madness do fucking fantasy baseball yeah run of the Dennis junior nc state alone yeah so like none of which i do i don't play any other fantasy sports but I think in the off season is a time to be, for me at least, as a as a as a I guess creator, it's a time to uh, step back 
and look at things from a bird's eye view and think about the direction you want to go in. And this has absolutely nothing to do with you probably right now. I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but uh, this is a time where I like to be more creative. So I would say go get a fucking hobby, something that's a creative outlet for you, whether it's making videos or blogging or fucking sculpting or painting or making music or something. Find some kind of creative outlet that's not going to fucking piss you off and give you anxiety like fantasy football does to most of us. Um, and that's what you could do for the next four or five months. And I guarantee you, you will not regret doing something that sparks your creative outlet. Yeah, me personally, like in the position we're in where people like asking us questions all the time, like we like helping other people. But once the fantasy season's like three quarters of the way through, you're like, I can't wait for this to be over. Just like just to have your free time back and all that. And like fantasy sports wise, if you want to fill up your free time, DFS basketball and like DraftKings is fun. Monkey Knife Fight, promo code BDGE, play all those like star shootout type of things get a $50 uh, match, I think, on your first entry. Um, yeah, but just live your life, man. I mean, fantasy football will be back in like eight months. You get to start scouting players in like June, July, and all that stuff. I really like the build up to the draft more than that. So if you can just take these next few months off and then really like full head of steam in June, July, you'll, you'll probably like it a lot more than spending your whole year round uh, life just focusing only on football. Yeah, and you also, I saw you comment, play Dynasty, so the season is never over. I mean, Dynasty fantasy football is, it's fun. I would say, though, like those leagues aren't as fun unless you have a very engaged league. Like if you can get one going with your friends or you can get one, you know, find like an orphan team on, on Twitter or something where you know that people are going to be engaged. That's always fun because you can kind of stay talking football um, throughout the entirety of the offseason. So Dynasty is good because you start looking at shit like as soon as, you know, pe- uh, players are in their bowl games or players start um, performing at the combine. It, it, that's when you can really start diving into things. So Dynasty is fun. How to sell Derrick Henry. Very easily. Watch every video we've ever put out. I was going to say, we've just made 15 videos <laughs> weekly on exactly how to do that. Uh, sneak peek of next year's guys you like and don't like based on where you believe their ADP will. All right, let's just, let's just go like off the dome. Just guys that we're going to be high on next year. I got two right now just because it's like that second year jump. If they do have that on top of this. I really like, like, obviously, A.J. Brown's ADP is going to be skyrocketing based on his finish this year. But if Tannehill's back and if they add, like, a complementary weapon, I could see him just doing what he's doing right now. Obviously, not to the degree he's doing it at because he's on pace for, like, 1,800 yards over these past couple weeks. But, like, I think him being maybe, like, a sixth or seventh round pick next year, maybe a bit higher, but I'd be all in on that. And Debo Samuel, too. That offense is very good. Kyle Shanahan's, you know, an animal calling plays. And Emmanuel Sanders is just going to be a year older. Um, I think – Debo Samuels will be like 24 next year. He's a little bit older for a rookie, but what we've seen out of him, the flashes he's shown, he could take that Michael Gallup type leap in a very good offense and go for easily a thousand yards next season. Yeah, I, I like though. There's so many good rookie wide receivers that are going to get a lot of hype throughout the offseason. I know Terry McLaurin is going to be a target for me everywhere. I am nervous that, you know, his ADP is just going to like, he's going to be like a third round pick next year or some shit just because everyone's going to talk about him all offseason. So I might end up pulling back a little bit. Um, other guy. He's Brown too. He entered the year with that Liz Frank injury or some foot injury. Like he, he wasn't healthy most of this year. He wasn't even expected to maybe even play this season. That chemistry that he's building with Lamar Jackson, if those deep throws start to connect even more entering the season at hundred percent, he could be huge next season. Yeah. I already know. Like I'm going to say something like why draft Terry McLaurin in the third round when you can get a two round discount on Marquise Brown. Like I already, the, the, I, I'm having day Mondays. You're ready. Yeah, I'm having deja vu from shit that didn't even happen yet. So I, I like a lot of the wide receivers. I'm going to look at some of the running backs real quick. Yeah, I think a lot depends on, like, where different guys land. Like, because uh, Jordan Howard's a free agent this year. Kenyon Drake's a free agent. Like, if one of those backups, like, if Miles Sanders is the number one next year, he could be at a discount. But then again, people will probably be picking him high because he's in Philly and they have a good offensive line. Same with Chase Edmonds. Like, like that offense Joe taking it Joe Mixon or Miles Sanders next year? Oh, Joe Mixon, Joe yeah. Mixon is unbelievable. Yeah, Joe Mixon is going to be uh, probably picked around where he was again this year, but he's about to get back that their first round pick offensive lineman, and they're probably going to have Joe Burrows as their quarterback. So Mixon's been so fucking good over the last month, month and a half of the season. Um, so I expect him to be a super, super high draft pick again. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of interesting moves in free agency, specifically with Drake, Howard, and the Chargers backfield. Um, if Austin Eckler leads that backfield next year, would you take him in the second round? Uh, I, I'm skeptical to take him in the second round, although I know that's where you're probably going to have to take him. I mean, yeah, I, I probably, I probably would. 
Yeah, he's going to catch like almost 90 balls this year. And I think as the lead back, maybe that volume doesn't go up through the air. But on the ground, we saw him at the beginning of the season handle a load very well. That didn't sound good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think in the second round, late second round, if it's a full PPR league, I wouldn't hate reaching for him in like the early second just because he has that upside through the air. He's basically a James White that can get it done on the ground too. I'm so happy. I, I have a dynasty league where I own basically the entire Chargers backfield right now. And if things swing well this offseason – that could just set me up for fucking domination. I just whooped George's ass in the, in that league last last week, so I'm feeling good right now. Justin I'm, I'm Jackson got some run because Melvin Gordon can hold on to the ball, so that was good. Oh, he looked good too. Yeah, I'm actually nervous. Like, is Melvin Gordon about to get benched this week? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, they they know they have two games left with them, and then he's gone, so they're probably just gonna get everything they can out of him, even though they have no like reason to win these last two games. Bro, if Eckler, I have Eckler, and I think let me see one. Yeah, I have Eckler in three out of the four championship games I'm in. So if he goes off and has a big game, he's going to single-handedly. Basically, it's Eckler. 2019 was the Eckler year. Like, that was it. So owning him was almost as valuable as fucking owning Christian McCaffrey based on where you drafted a guy like Eckler. He's been such a fucking animal. All right. Uh, draft pick mistakes you made. Yeah, like, er, like early top 10 for 2020. We could probably do a full video breakdown on that eventually. Do like a – a mock draft, but it, off the top of the head, I'm thinking probably C Mac, Dalvin Cook, Barkley, Zeke, um, Derek Henry, Michael Thomas. Yeah, Michael Thomas, uh, D Hop. Like, I don't know if I would use a first round pick on D Hop again, to be honest with you. I'm not sure I loved what I saw from him. Um, like this, I mean, he, he obviously is performing great, but like he's not used at all down the field, and I feel like he's only really getting a ton of run because Will Fuller's been out for the entire year or Kenny Sills has been hurt or something like that. So I feel like a lot of it's been forced his way, although he has ended up producing well. But um, super flex, I mean, Lamar Jackson's going to be a top three pick next year. And I, this year I was hesitant to take Patrick Mahomes. It's like a top five even. Even like I didn't even want to use a first-round pick on him, but I think Lamar Jackson is easily every bit worth the first-round pick going into next year because you don't, you don't have to worry about like – unbelievable passing efficiency it's more um yeah if he passes for 150 yards and like throws two picks he'll still give you 80 on the ground and a touchdown and that like more than makes up always, that will always be there and it's not like he takes a bunch of big hits too so i'm not like worried about the fucking um i'm not worried about him like losing time due to injury or anything where you usually think about that when it comes to running quarterbacks yeah, it's definitely not a top 10 pick, but I'm like super in on Kyler Murray for next year. If they add like a CD lamb through the draft, just get more weapons for him. Like they don't even need that good of an offensive line for him to produce because he's so mobile. Uh, I think he opens up the run game a bit next year because through the first like four or five weeks, he wasn't using his legs at all. I think another year under his belt could really help him and that offense could be very good next season. Yeah. All right. We got a lot of uh, rookies for next year, rookies for this year, review of trade targets, uh, a, a morning for those who had Godwin and Cook on their roster. Yeah, it's fucking brutal if you went to the champion. I have a my – I'm going to get absolutely destroyed in, in one of the dynasty leagues that I'm in because I just traded away like four players for Zeke. And then my RB2 right now is Royce Freeman. I've lost Chris Godwin, T.Y. Hilton, Darius Geis, like five players, and I'm going to be rolling out a fucking – disgusting disgusting team in the championship so i'm gonna need a ton of luck on that but yeah r.i.p to anyone who had uh there's probably people who had like mike evans godwin dalvin cook stack and then they're just absolutely fucked right now for the is dalvin cook like officially out this week i heard that he might play he's not gonna play for us he's week. not no right. way i doubt it. he's out it's fucking mike boone season baby um a lot a lot of people are asking about the upcoming rookie class and Realistically, we have not dove in enough. I mean, it's still 2019, so I have not dove in enough on the 2020 class for rookies, uh, but that will be available in our Dynasty Guide, which is uh, probably going to go on pre-sale either January or February, uh, and that will have write-ups on every skill player prospect. That will have exclusive mock drafts that we do in there. That will have Dynasty rankings, rookie rankings, all those kind of things. So stay looking out for that. We haven't started on it yet. Um, so a lot of work to be done for that. Uh, a lot of dynasty content, a lot of rookie content will be covered over the next few months. Yeah, I looked into it a little bit and Scott, if you're watching, just give me all your first round picks because everybody's basically Amir Abdullah. So there's no point of like keeping this capital. It's not going to turn out well for you. Yeah. I don't have a lot of first round picks this year, which is not a good year to have sold your first round picks, unfortunately. <laughs> But it worked out because we're in the chip for both dynasty leagues. So that's what that's what you got to play for in dynasty. Like a lot of people love, you know. Here's the other thing: 
with like trades in Dynasty is you could win a trade based on value, but still lose that trade. Like we talked about this a week or two ago where I basically have a few untradeable players on my roster and you could offer me a very good trade that in value, you know, would, um, would be a win for me, but I still will turn it down because I just want the centerpiece of my team. Like for instance, like Yannick in, in our dynasty league traded away Michael Thomas, like, uh, you know, halfway through the year. And he's arguably like probably like the, almost the number one pick in a dynasty uh, startup. Like right now, if you're doing it, it's probably like C-Mac Barkley and then Michael Thomas or something like that. And it's just like, that's a guy he's untradeable. Like you don't trade a guy like him. So even if someone offers you like an, oh, so th there's been ongoing discussions between the person I'm playing in the championship right now and snacks as a trade snacks is DeAndre Hopkins. The other guy had OBJ. So they wanted to swap so he can get D hop for the playoffs. He was giving OBJ plus like four picks. It was like next year's first round and a second and the following year's first round and a second or some shit like that. And I'm like, okay, if you really, really, really believe that OBJ is going to come back to elite status, then yeah, that's going to be a good trade for you. But you're only winning this trade right now based on value, based on projecting a lot of shit. Because right now, D-Hop is still an extremely, extremely high asset dynasty uh, player. And he's just someone that I, I, I don't want to trade away. He's, he's like the cornerstone of your dynasty team, you know? Yeah, and it also depends like on your roster construction. If you're rebuilding and like somebody offers you, let's say a Julio Jones for like a first round pick and like a young receiver, that's not going to help your team because you're not competing now. And Julio, by the time your team is competing, will be basically like what Larry Fitzgerald is right now. So yeah, you have to look at like the grand scheme of things. And the other thing about Dynasty too is like some people just build for the future and just keep building and never really have a winning window. They just like build to build and then they never really compete. Yeah, the startup draft is so interesting because the, the value that you can get in startup drafts is, I mean, you really, like, you can build for the future. There are a lot of guys in the league right now that have, like, you know, they maybe were, like, the sixth seed or something, got knocked out first round, but have a ton of young value at wide receiver, which is why the startup draft is so important because I tried to mix and match my team with a lot of young talent, but also, like, I was able to get Julian Edelman in, like, the 10th round. Right. So that is not obviously someone you want to have as a dynasty asset, but like he gives you solid wide receiver two, wide receiver one numbers for the entire year. And that's going to help you. That's going to help you get to the championship. Whereas you can also take, you know, you could have drafted like a James Washington or Deontay Johnson in the 10th round and built for the future. But that's going to depend entirely on what you've done up to that point in the draft. So I think you always want to get a mix and match of value with veterans, with young players. And that's how you build a championship team. And you keep doing that. And then eventually, you know, if, if you see no more use for it, like I, like Julio is a guy that I would definitely be looking to offload right now in dynasty. If he's not going to help you win a championship, because there is someone that would take him to, to, you know, help get them to that next level. So uh, where I'm at right now, I still do have a lot of mix of good veteran players. Like I just gave up actually a trade. I just made like two weeks ago with Scott. He gave me Zach Ertz. Uh, he gave me Zach Ertz and I gave him TJ Hawkinson. And I think we exchanged a pick or something. But that was something like I'm going for the championship right now. I had Jared Cook who just got hurt. Uh, so I didn't know if I was going to have him available. But Zach Ertz could probably be like semi-league winner for me. So that's a trade. You know, obviously Ertz is 29. Hawkinson was a rookie this year. So in the long term, of course, you're going to want Hawkinson. But then again, Hawkinson hasn't proven anything. It's a lot of projection. It's a lot of upside when we know Ertz is a top three fantasy asset right now. And one championship is good enough shit talking that you can have for the next like four or five years to be like, okay, I gave up all that that youth that I don't really care, you know? Yeah, and building off that point, you said like mixing youth with like older players. I'm sure we'll do a video talking about like startup strategy, but like in my dynasty league and our startup, it was a tight end premium. And you can get guys, like I personally got Greg Olson around like 15 because nobody wanted to touch him. But for the first half of the year, he was like a top 10 tight end for me and somebody that could flex over guys like Mike Williams and like mid-tier wide receiver threes because in tight end premium, all you need is five catches and 50 yards to get yourself like if it's one and a half times uh, per reception, that's... 12 and a half points. And that's decent enough for a guy you can get in the 15th round and rely on him week after week. No, that's exactly that. That's a great point because I, I traded up to get TJ Hawkinson in the sixth round. And he was obviously the first tight end I drafted, but I also knew that I'd be able to get a vet. Like I got Jared cook in like the 15th round. Whereas in like redraft leagues, Jared cook was like a seventh or eighth round pick this year because we knew he was going to produce right now. Whereas I didn't think, you know, we were going to get much production out of TJ Hawkinson rookie year. I knew I could play Jared cook this year, him do fine. And then have, you know, Hawkinson, uh, for later on in his career. So those are the things you have to think about because the ADPs of 
redraft compared to dynasty are very different when it comes to veteran players. So you can reach up earlier on for younger players, even though they won't produce right now because you can get veterans like reaching up for, you know, for instance, like a DJ Moore this year was an early dynasty pick. And you might've been a little hesitant because we haven't actually seen him really produce at an elite level on the NFL field. Obviously he ended up breaking out this year, but you like, you could have used a third or fourth round pick on DJ Moore and still gotten like the Julian Edelman in the ninth or 10th round. And so, you know, like, had that production that you want on a DJ more in the future this year for Julian Edelman. And it costs you a third round and a 10th round to get that wide receiver one, two slot. So those are the things you really need to be cognizant of. And it's not always just about youth, 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 and future, future, future. It's about mixing and matching knowledge of, of both players where you can get both guys and being able to like think ahead that way. Yeah. And if you're like fully in on like building just straight youth, you like people don't realize it but by week eight week nine week 10 and your team isn't producing like say rookie season you had like a dj chark uh you had a Cortland sutton you had like christian kirk guys that really weren't producing not only like do you start losing like you're not having fun in the league because you're not winning but you start losing hope too because you're like what if these guys never break out and then nobody wants to trade for them either just because they're young so i think you have to mix and match with youth and upside just so you can compete unless you're in a full rebuild and you have like a ton of picks stockpiled and you have enough you know, bullets in the chamber to take your shots. But um, yeah, I don't think you can just go completely youth without another backup plan to have guys like Julian Edelman or Greg Olson or like a Delaney Walker to help you win if you want to compete for this year or even next season. Yeah, and I also think that a, a, a proven asset to me is worth way more than, than Pixar because at the, very, at the very best, the people that follow Debbie Leagues, the people that play in Dynasty Leagues year-round, the people that are looking at the rookie classes. Like me and Noah are probably going to be looking at the rookie classes for like three months before the NFL draft even starts. We'll still probably miss on 50-50% of our rookie picks, which means the general public will probably be even worse than that. So for you to value your picks more than valuing a player that we already know can produce on an NFL field is a little bit ignorant. So yes, it's nice to build for the future and have the picks as assets, but it's also nicer to have players that will be able to you know get into your lineup right away so I'd always value a proven asset over a pick yeah and Uh, the other thing about that too is like in dynasty leagues like the rookies upcoming like the outlook on them changes in a split second like last year Hakeem Butler we liked him as like a top five guy because he had all the intangibles if you were to redraft the 2019 class I'm not sure he gets picked he went in like the fourth round he tested out of like his testing numbers were incredible but he's never going to really do much in this league. And maybe he does, but what's he ever going to be? He's not going to live up to the hype that he had preseason. Even this year, like a Jerry Judy. People were saying he's the next Julio Jones. Now he's not even consensus top five pick. So like the outlook on these guys changed so often. Um, Just because you have that top three pick doesn't mean he's going to turn into a McCaffrey. There have been plenty of busts. People were taking like Ronald Jones ahead of Nick Chubb. Even Darius Geist to this point has a return value in two years. Like you have to, I'd much rather take somebody that I know is going to produce for the next three to four years and try to take a shot on somebody that I like because he was playing against people that will never play in the NFL, like on a college field. Yeah, I mean, it, it just like redraft. It's, you know, ADP is, is fun to use while you're drafting just to give yourself a baseline for value. Soon as people step on the field week one, like Hollywood Brown, I would say consensus, barely a first round pick this year in 12 team leagues for rookie drafts, probably early or second round pick. Week one, he blows up, boom. Like, you wish you had taken him top five. Terry McLaurin, same thing. Week one, blows up. You know, you wish you had taken him, like, very, very early in the draft. So these things happen so, so quickly. So to pretend like you know everything that's going on and what you're predicting just because you watched, like, a film on one fucking guy, do not come into the year with that mindset. And, I, I you know, I, say, I usually start off my summer videos saying the same shit every time. I know I'm going to get tons of shit wrong. You're going to get tons of shit wrong. So we put out our best analysis and let y'all use that and draft well. And, and hopefully it helps y'all get to your, uh, your chip this week. And I believe that's pretty much all the questions that we had for today. So we're going to wrap up that video here. Uh, let us know if you are in the championship, what your lineups are looking like. If you have any sit start questions, you can drop them in the comment section down below. But if you want answers for sure, go over to Patreon, patreon.com slash BDG where you can get the weekly rankings and all that kind of good stuff behind the scenes. Make sure you're following both of us on the Twitter at Nick underscore BDGE at FB God. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you did. And I'm not really sure what we're going to be doing going forward, but we will uh, see you next time.